Okay, um, hello everybody um, and welcome. Uh, it's very nice to see many of you. And um, well, this is the last webinar that we have for the Zapatista's journey for life. So the title of today's webinar is Football and the SZLN. My name is Lourdes and I am from Oaxaca in Mexico. And of course, I love to play football. Um, so, and I am so pleased to be chair in this webinar today. So we are going to be joined today by Zeus, uh, Will, and who will be each speaking for about, now we have more times, so I think half an hour each followed by Q&A and some final announcements announcement at the end, at the very end. So this uh, webinar will explore some of the ways in which radical football is connected to the Zapatistas, to the Zapatista resistance. And not only football is constantly referred to in the Zapatistas communiques, los comunicados, but also it is part of the vitality of their communities. Uh, football has been important to the Zapatistas to create links of international collaboration and holding international World Cups in the territories and attracted, attracting players of all walks of life. The Zapatistas are building through football a world in which many worlds fit. Um, so, okay, I, 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 by way of introduction to our speakers today, I am delighted to introduce Will. Uh, Will is a writer and author of Freedom Through Football, a biography of Britain's most intrepid sport club, uh, the Eastern Cowboys and Cowgirls, who have been involved in solidarity work with the Zapatista communities for over two decades. Um, sadly, um, Malcolm uh, won't be able to join us today, where we are be thinking of Malcolm. And then following is Zeus, uh, the current chair of Eastern Cowboys and Cowgirls Sport and Social Club who has been a member of the, club, of the club for over 10 years and has helped organize and participated in two women's football tours in the occupied territories of the West Bank of Palestine with two other radical women's football teams, Republica Internationale in Leeds and Frau Dörte Becker in Hamburg and she has subsequently given many talks about women's football in Palestine and how it is seen as a form of protest of the occupation. Um, so we are very happy to have you here today and I'm looking forward to learn more about La Otra Cascara um, in more radical ways. Uh, so I'm going to invite the speaker to begin their presentations, beginning with Will, please. Hi, um, yeah, great to, nice to meet you all. Some familiar faces. Um, hi, Suze, um, Claudio, and um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about a bit about um, how on earth a Sunday league football team from Eastern and Bristol came to do free. I think it's free to us to the occupied um, the um, um, the, um, the autonomous zones and chapas, and how we got involved in in, in Zapatista solidarity, which is kind of unlikely, but um, it started around about 20, 23 years ago now, about nineteen ninety eight. Um, Cowboys and Calgal started in, in nineteen ninety two and. It started really from a bunch of people who were, had been involved politically with various things in the 1980s, be that squatting or anti-poll tax stuff or um, anti-fascist work. Um, 
and you know but for many of us basically it was, it was a case of um wanting to get away from doing that a little bit basically and, and just concentrate on playing football which we all loved obviously um but i, I guess um our our experiences of the 1980s in terms of activism um, came through eventually into what we did as a football club um, and this started from quite small beginning beginnings really just inviting um, we were invited over to um, to Germany to play um, with some German teams in 1993 and realized they're a lot like us and we we should do the same thing the following year in 1994 so we held a little tournament in Oldbury Court in Bristol I think eight teams turned up to and these tournaments got um, bigger as the years went by. And in 1998, we held our, our biggest tournament yet, which we called the Anti-Racist World Cup. So we had teams from um, not the Anti-Racist World Cup, the Alternative World Cup. What am I talking about? <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so the Alternative World Cup um, involved teams from um, from Poland, from Germany, from Ireland, from France, and there's a team from South Africa that um, we funded to get over here. We managed, to, we did that through union contacts and um, anti-apartheid contacts. And it was at the, um, at the 1998 Alternative World Cup, a couple of activists from Bristol who had recently been out to chat us, um, approached us, um, we approached Roger, who's very much um, one of the driving forces behind the uh, tournament and indeed the um, the link with um, the Zapatistas. Um, so these two activists floated this idea that um, why don't uh, why don't we send a football team over to Chappas? Um, because at that point there'd been um, uh, the government of the time, I think the Salinas government, I think, no, um, um, a band um, um, foreigners from visiting Chappas, but there was a loophole there was, I believe, there was a loophole that meant the sporting visits were allowed. So these two activists had the amazing idea to, to, um, um, to take advantage of this loophole, organise a sporting visit to Chappas and, um, and you know, do some solidarity um, through football, basically. And um, a group of us from the club um, were really infused by this. Not many of us had actually heard of the Zapatistas prior, prior to this, um, because it, even though it had been, you know, I think about four or five years since the initial uprising in 1994, but um, it didn't make that big a headlines in the UK at the time, really. Um, I've heard of, I've heard of them vaguely, but um, didn't really know that much, really, apart from the fact that they had risen up against the Mexican government. Um, so, yes, yeah, so in 1999, May 1999, about 25 of us, um, including a few guys from Republic Internationale and the one in 12 club in Bradford, um, went out to, um, to, to Chappas and um, had just an, what was an amazing adventure. Um, I'm not sure what our expectations were prior to the trip. I think, I think what I remember most from that trip is um, being surprised, I guess, at how, um, how sort of um, quiet and um, self-contained and um, um, yeah, sort of stoic I guess really um, the people from the communities were I think well, a lot of us were kind of expecting um, you know we'd seen we'd seen images of ski masks um, and members of the EZLN and I think we were expecting people that uh, the Zapatis a bit more kind of loud and brash I think so it was it was interesting that um, our expectations were slightly different to um what we, you know, what we expected. Um, but we were, you know, we, we were, know, so many memorable things in that first trip, honestly, it was, it felt kind of 
bit dangerous and risky. We had to go between communities uh, under cover of darkness and in a battered old van that had bullet, bullet holes. We had to hide away, hide from the army. Of course, at that point, there's still army bases in Chappas. Um, and if the army had seen us, then we would have been um, deported out of um, Mexico, um, quite likely. Um, so, and on the football pitch, they were, um, they were all right, I suppose, really, but um, we used our heights to our advantage, and I think we won two or three tournaments. And, and, um, but people seemed to enjoy our, our presence. Um, so we, we finished that tournament, uh, that, sorry, that, that visit. And I think a lot of us didn't want, didn't want to be, this to be the end of it, really. Um, so returning to Bristol, we um, um, we had this idea of raising money for um, a water project in one of the communities. Whilst out there, we'd seen that um, um, that, that um, quite often in the communities um, they didn't have uh, fresh water systems, and of course, there were a whole load of um, you know, waterborne diseases that people were suffering because of that. So this was something we could actually help in a very sort of um, practical, concrete way. So we raised some money, well, club night, I believe, um, in the Feckler in Bristol, which raised, I think, as a, I think it was four figure sum. I think it was. Um, so we um, sent that out via um, Concern of America, who were um, activist NGO who have been, been involved in Chappers for a long time now. Um, and from this, I guess, um, Kiptic was, was born, this organisation, mainly of cowboys and cowgirls who um, have raised money for water systems out there um, for 20 years now. I think, I mean, I calculated a while back, we've raised over 120 grand in 20 years, which for a bunch of amateurs, who've really, it, it's all been banned off selling t-shirts and doing stalls and um, selling coffee, calendars and that kind of thing. Um, so a bunch, for a bunch of amateurs to do that's not, not, not bad really. So um, to backtrack a little bit, um, we, there were other full football um, tours off the back of the first one that um, were organised. The Lunatics from, from Antwerp, I don't know if anyone know the Lunatics football team. Um, they were kind of um, friends of ours from Antwerp and we encouraged them to do the same thing and go out there and they did a tour in November 99 and then in January 2001 um, the Cowboys and Cowgirls team went out there again and um, we played again a number of, number of matches and um, that, um, that tour was notable for um, an up-and-coming young graffiti artist named Banksy who tagged along with us and played in goal and did a few murals and um, and um, designed a T-shirt and yeah, all the rest of it. Um, and there was another uh, another tour in 2003. Republic Internationale played out there, um, and a further Cowboys tour in 2006 where we played basketball with them. So a women's basketball team went out and um, did the same thing as the football. So they went from community to community and. Um, yeah, the, the link, I suppose, has, has remained strong throughout 20 years. Um, so why football, really, I suppose? Why? And the, uh, it's Chappas, our, our involvement in Zapatista, for the first time we'd sort of seen how football can be a really good vehicle, or sport in general can be a really good vehicle in terms of, in terms of solidarity. And I, I guess um, one of the reasons is it overcomes any kind of language barriers. Um, immediately when you pick up a ball and start kicking it, um, you can you, you're, you're talking you're talking a global language, I guess. And um, yeah, so we were we were able to um, enjoy the company of our of our hosts and chappers and talk a little because you know a, lot of, a few of us learned, learned Spanish before we went over there, so we were able to converse a little bit. And um, 
it felt like also you were doing something useful because when we when we know went over there quite often you'd see um other westerners had gone over there as peace observers or were just kind of hanging out really um and yeah it, it felt to us as if doing football is something we were sort of engaging with um our hosts a bit more than just sort of just hanging out and and um you know, we're doing something concrete, I suppose. The support is a, is a really um, good area to, to do that in. And we kind of applied that again to other areas of the world. And, and Susan Shaw will um, talk about the link we have with um, Palestine now and the Palestinian um, um, course, um, which again is kind of applying that same idea of football, uh, solidarity through football to you know, another area of the world. Um, and for what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, I mean, Zapatis, like all of Mexico, are, are football mad. So, um, yeah, so again, it's, it's this common language you're speaking, really, and it's a really effective way of, um, of communicating and, and sharing something. And um, it, it's, 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 it, it's an easy way to do solidarity, to make a statement. Um, and yeah, it's a lot less it's softer in a way than just sort of other forms of activist work and really, because it's, it's, it's playful. It is play in a way, but you know. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's um, something we've, we've seen that has been very successful. Um, in the cowboys and cowgirls over you know, the last two decades, really, and um, our links to Chappas still remain strong. Kiptik still goes on um, raising money, and um, we hope in a few weeks' time we'll be able to host a, a small um, Zapatista delegation in Bristol. I'm not sure we'll stretch to a, a football game. Apparently, there are only I think it's going to be a small delegation at eleven, but you know we will meet them, and we'll certainly um, we'll certainly show them a plough. Our local pub in Bristol, um, which has got all the paraphernalia from all our different tours all over the world, um, and we'll hopefully be able to chat with them in Spanish and um, show them our um, where you know our, our headquarters, um, which is something we've been wanting to do for a long, long time. In fact, there was a, I think we first talked about a possible tour in the year two thousand. So the fact that it's finally happening um, is great, and. Um, yeah, I should look forward to showing them the plow. Hopefully in a few weeks' time, we can get in via immigration. Um, okay, that's all I had prepared, really. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, I don't know. Any, are we doing questions now or later, or do you want to do it, Lord? Yeah, thank you very much, Will. Um, I think we are going to do questions okay. later, yeah. But yeah, we, we can discuss a lot um, about football and resistance against capitalism um, and well. So um, yeah, um, so we have, uh, um, next we have Zeus. Um, I love that you have your t-shirt. I, I have my, my football shoes here, so. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's very hard to wear them now, but. Uh, <laughs> They are um, besides, so they are on my side. So, yeah. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I joined the Eastern Cowboys and Cowgirls sadly after the last trip um, to Chapas. So I came in after that, but it, it certainly was one of the things that inspired me to join the club when I'd heard these amazing stories about what the club had been doing. And as, as Will touched on, it, went, it went, then went on to inspire us to use that model to take football to other areas, you know, and I helped organise and participated in, in two women's football tours in, in Palestine, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but just firstly, I suppose, I wanted to talk about um, radical women's football in the UK, um, I suppose from a cowgirl's perspective, but also highlight some other um teams you know radical teams that you know we've come across on through, met through our journey 
Um, and it's also interesting to hear um, Lydia mentioned right at the beginning when she introduced herself that she's going to be starting a radical women's football team, which is amazing. And, um, you know, if you wanted to connect with me after this talk, I'd love to, you know, talk to you about that. Um, so before I start talking about that, I suppose what, what I thought think is important is just to look at the history of women's football in the UK. Um, you know, if you go right back to the 1920s or just before the 1920s, women's football was coming, becoming huge, really huge. You know, there was a point where they were getting, um, I think, 25,000 people turning up to one game at a stadium, which was huge at that time. And um, the FA banned women from playing football in the UK in 1921. Um, because these uh, women's teams were working class factory girls mainly and they were really really um, frightened by the rise and power of these working class people so banned women's football in 1921 and it wasn't until 1971 where they repealed that ban and it was allowed again and while women's football obviously continued during that period you know they weren't allowed to play in stadiums and it wasn't until actually 1993 that the FA in the UK started actually funding women's football, um, you know, a long time later. So, you know, when I look at my journey. I grew up in the 80s in Bristol and um, even playing football as a girl in the 80s was pretty radical. Uh, there were no girls teams for me in primary school. They let me play in the boys team. I was the only girl that played. And um, when I said to my mum, you know, I want to join a football club, there was no girls football clubs for me to join. So I actually joined the Bristol City Junior Reds boys team, um, which were very welcoming of me being the only girl. But I, you know, experienced my first uh, first time of experiencing sexism was when we went to play our first competitive match against another boys team. Um, and they, you know, took the mickey out of us for for having a girl in the team and um, you know I didn't last very long in football in that environment and um, I then went to secondary school and there was no football for girls sports were segregated and my footballing career you know ended at the age of 10 or 11 and um, I think probably at that time I thought I'd never play football again um, and it wasn't wouldn't be until nearly 20 years later that I discovered the Eastern Cowgirls when I was nearly 30 um, and started playing football again. And, um, you know, during that 20 years, women's football obviously grew massively in the United Kingdom. Um, but, but what it lacked and what, what the Cowgirls gave me, which was radical at that time, was um, their inclusivity. So, you know, they offered football for anyone, anyone that identified as a woman, um, you know, or now you know, non-binary as well. You know, it didn't matter whether you had skills it didn't matter whether you were fit um if you wanted to play football you could play football um so as well as the club being radical in all of its political activity you know that was very radical in that time um which is only um i think it was 2009 i joined um the eastern cowgirls um so getting that you know opportunity at 29 to be able to join a women's football team um, and, and still to this day, you know, we promote that idea of football for everyone so everyone can join, you know, we play in leagues, but we don't ever field our teams on ability. If you are an Eastern Cowgirl and you want to play in a competitive football match, you can join the team and, you know, that kind of um, ethos um, has been pretty, you know, very radical and it's one of the reasons why I, I love the Eastern Cowgirls. Um, and at that time, when I joined back in 2009, the, the, the leagues available to women in women's football, you know, there were 11 aside leagues and five aside leagues that the Cowgirls had tried to join in the past. But not only were they highly competitive, but they were unfriendly, um, often aggressive. Um, and just play the style of football that we didn't want to participate in, um, which put us in a position where we had all these women wanting to play football and no safe space for us to play that competitively. Um, so back in, um, not long after I joined, I think in 2012, 2013, one of the Eastern Cowgirls who'd been in the club for a long time, Zoe Gibbons, got together with another woman who was starting up another casual women's football team in Bristol with the idea of setting up a casual league 
um, to create this safe space for women to play football, but in a friendly, welcoming environment, um, you know, that would encourage women that maybe have not would not get into football to, to, to create teams and, and play. So we started the Bristol Women's Football Casual League. I think it was 2012, 2013, I can't remember. And I think in the first season, there was four teams in the league, two of which were Eastern Cowgirls. Um, and we just played each team twice and it was, you know, very small. And fast forward to now and um, last season, that league ha now has 24 teams playing in it last season, split into three divisions. Um, I help run the league and this season coming for September, we expect it to be up to maybe 30 teams um, and it continues to grow. And, um, you know, which has been fantastic to see. And it just shows what a gap there was for that casual level of women's football in, in the UK. And this league that we created is fairly unique in, in the UK. And um, even the FA in recent years tried to steal our idea and um, recreate a league very, um, very similar to ours, which, um, which didn't succeed. And, um, you know, they came to us and wanted to understand why their league hadn't been as successful as ours. And, and the beauty of the, the league that we created is that it's run and managed by players in the league. So, you know, the, the ethos and the spirit is, 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 you know, paramount throughout the league, right through from the committee that run it, you know, that also play in it. And that's just something that, that they can, you know, recreate themselves, which has been um, fantastic. Um, so that in itself, as I mentioned, has been radical about the Eastern Cowgirls in terms of the way they play football. Um, but also, you know, as a club, we've obviously been involved in a, a lot of political activity over the years, you know, some of which Will has spoken about in the club in general. Um, but with the Eastern Cowgirls, um, you know, we have um, been involved in lots of community projects locally um, and also international tours and I will come on later to talk about the the two football tours that we um, went on in in Palestine and, and, the, and the radical women's football over there which was um, you know we learned a lot from um, but also on a you know I suppose on a, a weekly day basis and a day-to-day -day basis the the, the beauty of having a football team is, uh, and a big community is collectively, you know, you can work to help people, you can educate people, you can raise money. Um, so, you know, not only do we do a lot of um, fundraising for local community projects, um, like we've, um, we fundraise for our local community centre, we fundraise to help this new breakout space for uh, local adopted children. Um, we've raised money for local playgrounds. Uh, we've supported both club members and other people in the community who are fighting immigration deportation. You know, we've used the collective, um, the collective and the, the power of the club to, you know, to create real positive change. Um, and over the last 18 months, as an example, you know, where we've all been going through this crisis, our headquarters um, that Will mentioned, the Plough, which is a small pub in Easton, um, you know, had this idea that while they can um, open the pub to help the community by providing free fruit and veg boxes, which started out just being to help out the, the very local community and, and the club while everyone was unable to access shops um, or maybe were isolating. And um, our club's been a massive part of supporting that. And that that has grown over the last 18 months to, you know, we've raised thousands and thousands of pounds and delivered thousands of fruit and veg boxes for free to all over Bristol, you know, as another example of how the football club and its community has really had a positive um, impact. Um, so, you know, we, I, I think the beauty of football is, you know, it not only helps people on an individual level, so it's really powerful in helping people's both mental and physical health. You know, it can deal with isolation, it can deal with loneliness, it can create friendships, so it helps people individually. But then when you look at the power of a football team and a football club and the power of that collective of people and what they can do for communities and fundraising um, and educating people, it's, um, you know, it's really amazing in terms of what it can achieve. Um, so, I just wanted to next 
um, highlight some other um, football teams that I've I've met along the way, women's football teams that I've you know been in been impressed with in terms of both their political activity, but also um, you know uh, why I feel they're radical football teams. Um, you know, there's there's of course um, Republica Internationale that um, Will mentioned, who've been around for for many years, if not you know longer than the the Eastern Cowboys and Cowgirls, and they've got a, a women's football team um, that we have partnered with on many of our international tours. And, um, you know, they both were part of the tours to Palestine, which I'll talk about. But they're another great example, you know, if you want to look at radical football and how they've used football um, and how the football and politics has come to together to create something um, beautiful. Um, but I think recently, one of the things that's impressed me about um, uh, Republica and, and their football is is going back a few years. Um, you know, we 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 play in lots of tournaments, both in the UK and internationally. And um, you know, for women, it's always felt that the women's tournament has come second to the men's football at these tournaments, and we'd often felt like sidelined in terms of um, our place there. And um, one of the things Republic has done in, in recent years has actually within their own tournaments is scrapped having separate men and women's tournaments and created mixed gender tournaments, you know, where all the teams there have to have a split in their team of both men and women. And they do it in a way where if they're a men's team coming, they'll lend them women from Republic or other teams to ensure that everyone can do that. But it's really taken away that inequality that we found in the past where, you know, when there are men and women's um, teams. So that's something that I thought has been really radical from them. And, um, you know, that model is being used by other teams now. Um, the football tournament that's been organised, the Kill the Bill tournament in London next week, which um, we'll talk about later, you know, is using that model of well as well of having it as a mixed tournament, which is um, great to see. Um, so I think... Um, one of the one of a couple of teams that I wanted to highlight are where they've used football to unite communities that are maybe divided. And that's another beautiful thing about football. It unites people. So there's um, a long standing team in Glasgow called United Glasgow um, who've been around for probably 10 years now, I think um, I would need to check. Um, but we, um, we came across that team about five years ago. Um, they got in touch with us because they'd heard about the club and wanted to introduce their women's team to our women's team. And we went and played them um, in Glasgow, um, which, was, which was fantastic. But their team um, came about um, through wanting to unite um, unite areas of Glasgow. They're a, a team that um, welcomes refugees. And, um, you know, often they found in working class parts of Glasgow, there was this division between working class people and the refugees, um, you know, that were moving into Glasgow. And so the idea behind the team was, was not only to um, try and unite parts of Glasgow in, on that basis, but also taking away um, the, the, the financial restrictions of joining a football team. Um, so, I mean, they talk about on their website, their two guiding principles when they started out was anti-discrimination um, and financial inclusion. So they've been going for nearly 10 years now and they've had players from over 50 countries and they've done a massive amount of work in Glasgow, you know, to really create this amazing space through football for welcoming refugees, providing them, you know, um, uh, this amazing football team where they're supported financially to be able to be included in it, but also integrating that with working class people within Glasgow playing football. And it's, um, you know, been beautiful to see that, that team grow. Um, and I just recently, only within the last few weeks, heard about a similar women's football team um, up in Leeds, um, which is called Holbrook Moor FC. 
And um, I don't know whether you know the the uh, the importance of Holbrook Moor, but um, it's an anti-fascist reference um, for those that don't know. Back in um, 1936, I'm just checking my notes to make sure I get that right. Um, there was a big um, clash between the British Union, Union of Fascists, led by Oswald Mosley, and a massive group of anti-fascist demonstrators that took place in, in Holbrook um, back then. And the, the fascists were outnumbered by the anti-fascists. It's a very famous uh, moment. So this new team have called themselves Holbrook Moore FC. Um, and it was, it's been set up by a, um, and actually a, a theatre collective in um, Leeds that have been supporting communities similarly to our club with food parcels and veg boxes over the pandemic. And um, they decided to set up a football team again to unite the working class members of Holbrook because it's a deprived area in Leeds with refugees so that's the purpose of the team and they're doing that through providing free football for women um, and they've only been going four or five weeks now but it's um you know they're already already getting i don't know 15 20 people turning up to their training sessions which are a mixture of you know working class um lead people from leeds and, and refugees and um my um friend through who's an ex-republica player who's coaching them has just told me some really positive stories about them um, which is fantastic. And then I suppose the other um, side to women's football uh, and football, which I touched on, is um, um, where I, I've seen sort of radical teams, is this whole idea of how important um, sport in general, but football can be for uh, people's both mental and physical well-being, and how important it is to create safe spaces for women to play football. So... Um, one team which I met uh, or we met a few years ago is a team from London, East London, called Queer Space. And um, actually, they, the, the team came from an initiative called Queer Space, um, Queer Space East. And um, that's basically a group of queers that created a radical community space in East London. And it was for any queer community groups um, organizing around immigration, housing, anti-racism, fighting austerity, providing services like education, childcare and mental health. And it was about creating a, not only a safe working environment and a safe community space, but it was anti-capitalist in the sense that um, that area of London is massively gentrified and people can't afford these spaces. So the whole idea was to create this affordable working space. And on the back of that, they created a football team, um, Queer Space FC, um, who we invited and played with in, in a tournament that we held a few years ago. We continue to connect with, but they're doing great things in terms of creating a safe space you know, for um, people with all sexual orientation, you know, to play football where maybe they are welcome in other football clubs. Um, and um, the final example I was just going to give is another new team in Bristol, um, a team called Team Brave. And, um, you know, th they're not political in any sense, but again, they've come off the back of an initiative about the importance of sport for, for mental well-being. And, you know, they've created this team that's trying to encourage women um, who maybe are unfit, haven't participated in sport before, don't feel they can participate in sport and encouraging them through free sessions to come and try out football, um, you know, to, to uh, you know, as a form of helping them with their mental health, fitness and, and everything like that. And um, they've received lots of um, funding to really grow that initiative out of Bristol and it's becoming uh, really successful. Um, so um, the last thing I wanted to, to talk about before we move on to questions is, a, is about Palestine. Um, you know, while I don't have the experience with the Zapatistas, apart from, you know, what I've learned from our club, you know, I do see similarities with um, their struggle in, in terms of um, how the Israeli occupation, you know, is is causing, um, you know, um, the troubles it's causing for Pal Palestinian people, you know, not only are they being displaced, but they are being restricted in terms of 
their access to water, their access to electricity, you know, their access to building, um, their access to movement is restricted. Um, so it's a, you know, a, a, a social cause that, um, you know, we have supported over the years. And um, off the back of that idea of um, a solidarity football tour that came about through the Zapatistas, you know, the men's uh, part of our club did a similar thing in Palestine and went on a few tours. And then um, back in 2012 or 2013, I think it was, um, a, a woman who had been part of the first ever women's football team and national football team in Palestine actually came to Bristol and um, we met with her and she sort of gave us the idea of um, why didn't we um, go on a football tour to the West Bank in Palestine. Um, and it was actually, you know, I suppose at that point, although we were, uh, we were aware of the, the struggle of Palestinian people, we weren't very knowledgeable about it. So part of that was to go and learn um, and also being a, you know, a Muslim country, we weren't sure what football was being played over there or, or whether it was, um, you know, what, what we would find, you know, we really went there with open eyes, not knowing what we'd find. Um, and um, so back in 2014, we went on our first football tour there, organised by a, an organisation in Hebron called in Hebron International Resource Network, um, which is a, a non-profit organisation which helps communities predominantly in um, the South Hebron Hills, which is an area of the West Bank, where the settlements there face daily um, daily harassment from the Israeli occupation and illegal settlements in the form of having their homes demolished, um, harassment, you know, in, in, in simple terms from people from settlements throwing stones at them and abusing them. Um, so this organisation organised our tour. They tried to get in touch with, um, you know, women's football teams in Palestine to see whether they would be interested in playing, a, you know, a, a pub team from the, from the UK. Um, and, and we went on our first trip there. And, um, you know, it's very similar to what Will was saying about when he first went to the Chapas, you know, we, we felt it was a, a risky, a risky adventure that we were going on. You know, we, we couldn't go there openly saying we were a women's football team going to play football teams in Palestine because we'd have actually been turned away at the border. So we had to go in effect undercover. You know, we split into little groups and we all got our story straight about why we were going. And effectively, that was mainly to either go clubbing in Tel Aviv or, you know, go on a religious tour around Bethlehem and Jerusalem. But we all managed, um, managed to get there and, and, you know, met some amazing women, both on the pitch and off the pitch. And um, I think women's football in Palestine, you know, is, is radical for two reasons. Um, you know, firstly... On a, on a cultural level, it's radical. Um, it, it, there's many areas of Palestine which are quite traditional in terms of um, their religion, and, and that is that women don't participate in sport and definitely not football. And, you know, often, a, 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 you know, a woman's place in society there is in the home, so, and, or studying, and so anything that takes them away from that is not seen to be um, appropriate. Um, so, you know, we we met on our first tour a women's football team at Hebron University and um, the university didn't want anybody to know that they even had a women's football team. So we weren't allowed to publicise that they had a team or that we were playing them. We played them closed doors, no photography. Um, they didn't want it to get out into the community and you know we met these amazing women um, who just started on their football journey and were really passionate about football and wanting the opportunities to play it um, but most of them were you know lying to their families and, and, and wouldn't even tell their families they were playing football and and then we 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 met football teams from the other end of the spectrum you know we were fortunate enough on that first tour to meet and play with the Palestinian national women's team, the under 19s team, um, who obviously are supported by their football federation and, um, you know, have played internationally. And, you know, while, um, you know, while they are very open with their families, as they would have to be about playing football, you know, they still face um, uh, bad publicity in the press. You know, we heard women talking about, um, 
going out training in shorts and then the papers writing horrible stories about them the next day and having their pictures in the paper um, and all these you know horrible stories so culturally it's a really big step for women over there um, to, to play football um, and then also there's the political challenges um, you know as I mentioned before actual the, the freedom to move in Palestine is really restricted so not only do they have checkpoints throughout the West Bank but um, you know the, the, the Israeli government can put up um, temporary checkpoints anytime, any day, and often do that just to restrict the movement of Palestinians. So we were meeting teams, and it's the same the men experienced when they played men's football over there, who even meeting to train, if you had um, players from different cities, was sometimes impossible because they would put checkpoints in the way so they couldn't get to each other. So even meeting as a team to play is a challenge. And then beyond that, you know, trying to play in a league um, when you're trying to meet teams from other cities and travel around um, be be has become, you know, is very challenging for them. And often their movement is so restricted that they can't do that. Um, but the, the Palestinians, and I'm, I'm sure it's probably the same for the men, it certainly was for the women, the Palestinian women's teams that we you know, saw again, like all of us are, you know, as a, as a nation are very passionate about football, you know, the women really want to, to play football, but they see the act of playing football as a form of protest to the occupation, the illegal occupation, because, you know, for them, it's their way of saying, especially for the women, you know, we're here, we can do normal things like play football. We're not moving. We're not going to be moved off our land. We're here to stay. And, you know, the simple act of playing football is that act of resistance to say, you know, we're here and we'll continue to do that. So despite the many struggles they face, particularly the women's teams, both culturally and both, you know, politically in terms of actually just getting to play football, they're very passionate about it and they're continuing to struggle, you know, to do that. And it's not been an easy journey. And in fact, when we went back to visit them the second time, you know, at that point, they were finding it even more challenging, particularly around, um, you know, culturally trying to get girls into, into football at a young age because their families are encouraging them to study. And, you know, once they've completed that, you know, it's all about um, getting married, starting a family and, and, and coming into the, the family home. So there's a very short lifespan that women can play football in, in, in Palestine and it's a challenge for them. But there's a lot of cultural change. Um, you know, we met a great organisation, a university or college in Bethlehem called the DR Academy, which is a sports and arts um, academy which came about to try and encourage um, pa the Palestinian youth to get into both sports and the arts and they really encourage women into sports and, and, and men into the arts as that's you know as a, to try and break those cultural norms and they're doing you know great work and the football federation in Palestine is really supporting the women's football team um, you know to try and change people's opinions of women's football in Palestine but in, you know, they talked to us about simple acts of, you know, that that team in Hebron that we paid in 2014 that where we weren't allowed to tell anyone about it and it was through closed doors. In the gap between when we went back, the Football Federation had actually made the, the league winners go and play that team publicly in, indoors, but publicly so the community knew and made them wear shorts. Um, to show the, the university there the progress that was happening. Um, you know, unfortunately, it led again to them being in the newspapers with a not nice article written about them. But, you know, it's their, their way of changing. And when we went back, you know, four years later, we played the, the team at Hebron University again. And, um, you know, this time they celebrated us coming and it was an open event and other women could come in to watch the game and we could take pictures and publicise it. So culturally it's changing, but the challenges, you know, remain and, and, and I think are getting, are getting worse for them. Um, yes, so I think that was about it um, in terms I wanted to say. So thank you very much for listening and um, yeah, I welcome any questions you might have. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. I, I really feel the passion that you have with this um, football and I also was transported to all those football pitches and all the possibilities that 
we can do with uh, with football. So thank you very much. No, it was really I could imagine. No, in in front of the ball, it happens to me that the war disappears. So time stops, mm -hmm. and it's this kind of passion. No, it's the war. Uh, it doesn't matter. You are with a group yeah. of yeah. different. So I wish yeah. we were in a, in a good, on a football pitch and we come back. <laughs> such a different form of this computer and all these virtual things I, that I didn't like. I just want to play football and do things and that's it. But yeah, thank you very much.